Hello, it's me, and do I have a show for you? If you don't know who me is, hi friends, I'm Erin Deal, and I am so excited for you to hear this episode with Shireen Daniels. Shireen is improving it all over the world. Now, Shireen is an advocate for anti-racism in business, a founder plus managing director of HR Rewired and chair of the African Diaspora Economic Inclusion Foundation. Now, with a mission to unlock over 1 million global conversations about race by 2025, Shireen's bespoke diagnostic approach combined with her personable candor, which I will contest, she's got great personable candor, supports internationally recognized corporate and household brands as they work towards dismantling systemic racism across their organizational structures. Her story has been featured in Forbes, She was recognized as one of LinkedIn's top voices for 2020 and is the winner of HR's Most Influential Thinker in 2021. Today's show is fire. She, first of all, we talked. I could have talked to her for two hours. It was so impactful. You're going to hear about anti-racism in business. And her company, HR Rewired, helps dismantle systemic racism. It is different from DEI. And she's going to talk to us about our own power, which is, pun intended, very powerful. She's also going to talk to us about uncomfortable conversations and being introspective with how you first feel if you say something wrong at work. And really realizing that advancing racial equity requires you to make space for when people call you out. And then it takes analyzing this fear in order to allow it to have a solution and allow us to grow and unlearn and be the individuals that we are. She's so fun. She's so funny. Uh, We talk a lot about how have to be afraid of people who have nothing to lose. So she really found her voice and how she found that voice and really stepped into her own power. She is a powerful, wonderful, compassionate, and compelling woman who has found her assignment, her it. And I'm so happy she's here to share that it with us. Here is the one, the only Shireen Daniels. Are you a leader or change maker inside of your business, organization, or corporation? Are you looking for new, innovative ways to drive morale through the roof? Are you looking for fun and exciting icebreakers, team building exercises, and activities that will foster team growth, friendships, loyalty, and completely transform your organization from the inside out? Have you been searching for a fun and unique way to create change instead of this? same old dry, boring leadership books and icebreakers that aren't actually working. Hi, I'm Erin Deal, business improv edutainer, fail fluencer, and professional zombie who is ready to help you improve it. My mission in life is to help you develop teams and leaders through play, improv, and experiential learning. In this podcast, we will deep dive into professional development, team building, effective communication, networking, presentation skills, leadership training, how to think more quickly on your feet, and everything in between. We have helped everyone from Fortune 500 companies to small mom and pop shops transform their business, their leadership, and their people through play. So grab your chicken hat. We are about to have some fun. Welcome to Improve It, the podcast. Oh my goodness. I am so excited to welcome Shireen Daniels to the Improve It Podcast. Welcome, Shireen. Hello, hello, hello. Thank you so much for having me. Oh my God. Well, thank you for being here. I feel excited. I've been doing some internet stalking. I'm very pumped to know you now. And we were connected by a previous guest on this show, Raj Kumari, who we both feel we have a connection. You have, you said, a spiritual connection to, which I want to talk about in just a little bit. 
But I want to get to know you in just a different way. This is a fun game that we play in some of our workshops. It's called Five Facts, all right? And it has a little has a little ditty that goes on the top, okay? I've, and I'll do it in just a moment. But after I do it, I want you to give what we call the Improve It fam five facts about yourself that we could not find in your bio, in online, just things that are fun that we don't know that you want us to know. All right, so I'll do the little thing. Here it goes. It goes, five facts. Five facts, five facts, five facts, five facts. Shireen hit me with number one. I am a massive fan of paranormal romance novels to the extent that I always thought my first book would be a romance novel. Stop. Okay, two, two. I am Michael Jackson's biggest fan. Three. So. Oh, wait, okay, keep going with that. Keep going. No, well, I'm only going to say, because you know that people go, oh, yeah, obviously. No, no, no. This is how... Fun- this is how fanatic I was when, before he died, you know, when he was in hospital for a while, and remember all those people that were like queuing outside this hospital in LA, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I actually got time off work to see if I could take a plane to go and do the same thing. But the only problem was my daughter was about three years old at the time. So I couldn't get cover for her to go. <laughs> Stop it. Stop it. Stop it. I love this. Uh, part of me, part of me feels ashamed, but you know what? I'm not ashamed. I'm proud. Like I, I am you know, his biggest fan. So yeah, I I say that with pride. Okay. And you know what? I also, you can't beat, you can't beat it. (laughs) His music, pun intended, but I mean, he really is, he's an icon and I know there's some, there's some things, right? There's a lot of things, but at the end of the day, he, he did so much for the music industry. I don't want to harp on this fact, but I'm really glad I know it because I wish you were there, but I feel like there was something you did in replace of being there. So we're going to talk about that in a minute. Number three, number three. Number three. Um, if I could have an alternative career starting at my age of 41, I would love to train as a DJ. Stop it now. Okay. Four, four. Phantom of the Opera is one of my favorite musicals. I know it inside out and back to front. Love it. Okay, five. Oh, God, I can't think. What's the fact you do? Oh, goodness. Me. Oh, do you know what? I can throw shapes on the dance floor. I'm not a bad dancer. <gasps> yes. Stop. Yeah. I always, listen, I used to live in the club in my younger days. Like, yes. I still partly, if I could now, I would. But I was always that one that was out until five, six o'clock in the morning, just like on the dance floor. I'm not a big drinker, so I don't really do alcohol like that. But I was, yeah, I was the one. I was the one. R&B, hip hop, like you name it, that was me living my best life in the club. I love it. What was your go-to move? Like if you had one signature move, what was it? Like, can we even say this on the, on, on your show, but like the slut drop. <laughs> <laughs> like now, Erin, my knees don't, I haven't got Megan the Stallion knees anymore, so I can't do that anymore. But, you know, just, just so everyone can visualize, you know, yes. just visualize that move and just know in my younger days, like I could do that in a heartbeat. Just know that. <laughs> <laughs> That made my day. Okay, yes, the slut drop. And you know what? I'm here for it. I found a visual and I'm loving it. I'm loving it. Okay, this this makes me so happy. See, I love this game because these are things I wouldn't know. And now I do. And I have so many, I have so many questions. Also, one of my questions I like to ask people is, okay, if you could do something other than what you're doing, what would you do? And you said be a DJ, which I think is the coolest yes, thing. And I so would. Okay, I'm so here for that. I would be a rock star. Like, or like, I would just be a singer because it's like you can, music is so powerful. It really is. Yes. And you and I use words. We use language. We use our voices to be, I guess, music. But I don't have that tool to sing. Like, I'm just, I can dance. I I like, I feel like I can dance. All right. We'll say, we'll say. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, Me too. Yeah. I mean, in my head, I'm like Mariah Carey, but somehow something happens that what comes out is not quite that. I will give you a thousand percent um, yes to that as well. I will say my karaoke, if I have had a couple glasses of wine, which I have, I do like wine. That's that I feel like I am like Madonna. I'm just <laughs> crushing it. Um, but you know, in real life, it's not the same. It's not the same. No. It's, the, it's the thing I want to do. Oh, okay. Well, I love that you know our friend Raj Kumari. 
You are also a podcast host. You have Advancing Racial Equity 4.0. You're a vlogger. You're awesome. I want to go back to this. You told me at the beginning that you and uh, Raj Kumari are super spiritual. Tell me, tell me what you mean by that. Because I met Raj Kumari on the show and I was like, we're friends forever. Yes, I think she has that impact on people anyway. Um, but yeah, no. So what the, the really strange connection that I have with Raj Kumari is I shared one of her articles that she wrote um, about generational trauma and belonging in the workplace. She wrote it for the Fast Company and I shared it and was just like, listen, everybody, blah, blah, read this, you know, on my LinkedIn. And coincidentally, I just so happened to be connected to her. And um, somebody was like, oh, I want to introduce you to Raj Kumari. And I was like, not Raj Kumari and I was like not this person like typing away and yes it was the same person so we came onto this call there was three of us on this call um all fine like normal stuff you know oh yeah we're thinking about doing a live or a podcasting together and you know da, 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 da. and then it got to like the last 10 minutes when we were supposed to be saying goodbye and then I can't remember what I said I just I said something and Raj Kumari was like I feel seen and I was like no I feel seen and then we started on this whole other conversation and basically um like we've connected so many times Erin and we had like we were going to do this together we were going to do that together we were going to do part because we just you know we've, we've got that chemistry and it's never happened because every time we get together, we always end up talking about stuff that has nothing to do with the earthly plane is what I'm going to say. Um, and so I, it got to the point when I said to her, listen, we've just got to take the signals from the universe to say that you and I are not meant to do anything in what I call like the traditional capacity. We are meant to connect for a much more expansive reason than just what we do as like a day job. Um, but we, and we've kept trying, like, you know, it's been a couple of years now. We keep still keep trying and it still doesn't work, but it works in other areas. So yeah, that's, our, that's our connection. Very, very insane, isn't it? But yeah, that's it. It's not insane. I actually get it on very many levels. So I love it. And it's so wonderful when you can meet somebody that sort of shares that view. So I want to do this knowing knowing that. Let's set an intention for today's episode. What is one word that you want to get or you want to give, I should say, to our audience today? What's a one word intention that you hope to give to our audience during today's episode? Ease. Oh, I love that. Oh, okay. Because I feel that with you. I just love, because you're an HR conversationalist. You make the conversation flow. You're you're leading the way in HR for many people. As you know, our audience is made up of leaders, corporate leaders, HR leaders, people leaders, and you're leading the way for them to have tough conversations at work. You are an author. You are a podcast host. So I love when I did a lot of research on you, I, I, I read a lot about the work that you do with anti-racism and equity versus equality. So can we start with that? What do you think, why do you think leaders need to think about equity, not equality? My short answer is I say, you know, if you ask anybody how do they feel about racism? Universally, well, people will say that's really bad. And if you ask anybody, what do they feel about equality? They will say that's really good. And, you know, I believe that everybody should be treated equally. The problem becomes is when we know that not everybody is treated equally for lots of different reasons. And I hone in on on racism and the impact that has that has on predominantly black professionals in the business world and in the workplace. So what you end up with, people are pro-equality, but they are still anti-equity because they don't want to do anything differently to get to equality. So I believe that equality is the destination. Equity is how we get there. Mm. We cannot just become more equal by divine intervention. We have to do things differently. We have to unlearn, we have to relearn, we have to disrupt, we have to interrupt. And so the piece about the equity is from a leadership perspective, what you're doing is you're acknowledging that not everybody's experience in the workplace is equal. And you're also acknowledging that for some, their experience is always more favorable because of some of the inherent 
problems that we have built into the way society is constructed, particularly if you are on both sides of the Atlantic, so the US and the UK, other parts of the world. You know, pretty much every part of the world is impacted by racism just to different degrees in different ways because there are different histories and different contexts associated with that. And I would also say the uh, the root cause of all of my work or the, the root, um, yeah, the foundational pieces of, of Shireen D. Daniels and the work that I do is what I say is we're disrupting this notion of what and who is normal. Mm. I'm going to take that in for a minute. I love that. Right. I love that. You that is beautiful. It hits. Like it I like when I when you just said that, I have um almost like an automatic like emotional reaction to that. Yeah. Because what I love about your work is that it is so needed. It has been needed for so long. And I am so grateful that you are putting it into the world. And I'm so grateful that it exists and you are leading the way, right? I'm also grateful that there's 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 conversations that make people feel uncomfortable because we need that uncomfortability to make all feel like they are seen, heard, valued, and like they belong. And the fact that this is your life's work, this is your calling is it's so evident in all that you do. It's it's just so beautiful the way that you show up and the way that you're just, like you said, the word ease, right? Like you have it with ease. And I just think that that is magic. I think it's special. And I think that everyone needs to hear the HR conversationalist and have these conversations. So let me ask you this too, knowing just knowing that You've got this company, right? HR Rewired, you're the managing director. Can you tell us a little bit about HR Rewired? And if you could do it in, can we do this? Can we play, can we kind of make it fun? Can we, if you could describe it in three words, what would it be? Anti-racist, equitable, and kind. Okay, now tell us the full, give us a little more, give us a little more. But I love that anti-racist, equitable and kind. Yeah. So in essence, everyone's like, oh, yeah, that sounds really nice. But what do you do? Right. So what we do is we help companies who, in their own way, want to dismantle systemic racism. You know, so we are a HR company that specializes in that. That's the only thing that we do. So we don't, you know, we're not a diversity and inclusion company where I like to say we're anti-racism, we're pro-black. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, you know yeah. I mean? right we're pro humanity you know we're pro progression we're pro you know all of those things and the analogy that I always use when people go oh yeah but you know how different is that to diversity and inclusion because I get asked that a lot um is to say like years ago in 2012 I was diagnosed with stage four Hodgkin's lymphoma it's a long story in terms of like how I was misdiagnosed every possible opportunity but by the time I was diagnosed my wonderful consultant, Dr. Shafi, was like, right, we're going to make you feel better. But before we do that, there's some tests that we've got to run. He specializes in hematology. So um, Hodgkin's lymphoma is cancer of the blood. So it's part of like the leukemia family. If you can, you know, I don't want to say visualize the cancer, but, you know, the, these are terms that we're used to hearing. So he did lots of different ev- invasive tests, basically to try and work out where this cancer was, how far it was. You know, stage five is terminal. So I didn't have a lot of time, you know, before they had to do all of this work. Now, I always use that analogy because I say to people, you sometimes need a surgeon to go and tackle some of the things that happen in the workplace. You don't need a general practitioner, mm. right? The general practitioner is the is the GP that you go to for all jack of all trades, right? Is your is your you know is the general practitioner? So what I and the reason why I use that analogy is because I say you know your traditional approach to diversity and inclusion is a bit like a general practitioner because you're you're having to look at many different facets of how people's experience is is shown and not shown right within the workplace for lots of different reasons. Systemic racism is a very specific problem that needs a very specific approach. It's not to the exclusion of everybody else, but you cannot keep thinking. It's a bit like, you know, you wouldn't go to the dentist with a back pain. Like I always use that. I think I use that in my book because the point is, you know enough, 
You don't know what's causing your back pain, but you know enough to know if you go to the dentist and they give you half price root canal, that's not going to solve your problem. <laughs> nope. Nope. So you're going to get, you're going to get a half, you're going to have another happy in there. It's going to be a half. Right. Yeah. And so, you know, when people say, oh yeah, but you know, I, I, I feel uncomfortable. I don't know. I don't know. No, but you know enough to know that some of the places where you're going to get your solutions is not going to solve the issue. And I think the bits that people love or hate me for <laughs> is my specificity, if that's even a word. Like I'm really direct. Yeah. You know, I call it as I see it. And I don't pander to whiteness. I don't pander to discomfort, but my honesty in terms of my own journey. So what people are quite surprised at because they think, oh, you know, people who do this work are very preachy or very patronizing and it's a bit like shaking your fingers and this person is racist and that person is racist. Firstly, my argument is, listen, whether you call people racist or not, like, where do you go from there? Okay, then what? Like, what, what are we going to do with that? Yep. Okay, so let's let's do away with all of that. But also, we disrespect the seriousness of what racism is because we know that people have lost their lives, right? We know that people have been unfairly incarcerated. We know that people have lost jobs. We know, we know, we know. So every time that we try and dress it up to make it more palatable, maybe by not using the word racism and maybe talking about inclusion or belonging or, you know, all of those things because it's nicer, and saying the word racism, what we do is we disrespect its impact and we disrespect the people that, you know, I'm a direct descendant of enslaved people. You know, if if we imagine I go back in time a hundred and something years and I'm there looking at my great, great, great grandmother and her great grandparents, what am I going to say in terms of how I'm trying to ensure that what they went through is never replicated in human history? And so, Anything that I do that tries to soften it because I'm worried about how people might perceive what I say is disrespecting my lineage. It's disrespecting the experiences they have. And it's also disrespecting that the experiences of so many people in the workplace, right? So, you know, the first thing is, is I always say to people like, come with me because we're learning together. Like I had to learn. I was complicit in this system for most of my corporate life of 20 years because I didn't want to say anything. I didn't want to be the black woman talking about racism. I didn't want to hear that I was making everything about race. I, you know, I've got degrees. I've got two degrees. You know, I had a great job. I've got, you know, the the equivalent of the the house with the picket fence, even though we don't have a fence and we actually don't have a garden, but that's another story. <laughs> you know, so, <laughs> so you know, forget, forget that bit. But you know what I mean. Yeah. You know, this whole idea yeah. of um, the material trappings of success in inverted yes. commas. And so everyone assumes that somehow racism had passed me by. And what I started to realize is we don't understand what it is, and also we get our information from how the media. Um, whips everybody into a frenzy. Um, And, you know, whether it's displacement theory, you know, this idea that, you know, black people are here to come and annihilate the white race. And, you know, all of this, like, awful, unhelpful stuff that we hear. And it's preying on people's fear. Yes. Yes. That's what it's doing. It's preying on people's fear and people's insecurity. Um, And so, you know, one of the the conscious decisions that I made partway through my journey, Erin, is... I am not here to convince anybody that racism exists. That's not what I'm here to do. So you'll never see me on TV, on radio, doing podcast interviews where I'm having to debate the existence of racism. My job is to bring people closer to the issue, to the people that care, right? It's got nothing to do with skin colour, nothing to do with, you know, ethnicity, gender, all of these things. People who care and say, right, I'm willing to do the work like Shireen did the work. And I'm willing to go on the journey like Shireen's going on the journey. I want to do something. I just don't know what to do or how, which is very different to I have to do something and you've got to prove to me why. Yeah. Oh, I love that. So listening to you say all that, it's so you learned you were having to go on this journey. You want to take people on this journey with you. Can I ask this question? What if somebody listening today is listening, studying, wanting to go on this journey, but they're afraid of using their voice, what would you say? I would say that 
irrespective of how society has tried to shrink us to fit a box for the benefit of a few, and it is a very elite few, let's also be crystal clear, we have to recognize that we have inherent value, right? I talk about our sovereign power, and sovereign power basically means that the second you are born, you are valuable. So the value that you have does not come from external validation of individuals. It actually also doesn't come from um, the validation of people seeing you as who you are. Just know there is that inherent power within you because you're born. That's all, that's all the criteria that we need as individuals for our humanity to be recognized. Now, we know that society doesn't treat us that way, but it doesn't mean that we can't see ourselves that way. So for me, part of the the journey that people were witnessing, because they saw me show up on video every single day for 100 days at one point. I know, I kid you not, this is what I did. And they see me, they've seen me cry. They've seen, you know, me find something entertaining. And I'm very entertaining. I know you I think you can kind of get that. Like I do meet people. I got like, that. In among, yeah, did yes. you get that? In yes. amongst the seriousness of, yeah, do you see it? Because yes. I'm, actually a good, I'm actually a good time when I want to be. Um, but <laughs> well, we already talked about slut drop on this yeah, show. You, so we you've, got, you've got the jam. You've got, you, like, you've got it. I, I don't even need yes. to try pretend. Yes. But what I also, some of the things that I'm able to do and the way I'm able to speak about this issue and mostly not feel concerned about what people will think. And I do, you know, I have, I've got to tune out that voice sometimes, but that comes from me recognizing the value within myself. You know, it comes from me thinking to myself, do you know what? I volunteered for this assignment and um, to be here on this earth and to go through the experiences that I went through. That was a choice. So rather than me fight and push against it, I'm just going to go with it. You know, for the first time in, you know, all of the things that I've done did not come off the back of a plan, you know, and I'm very future focused, you know, I'm really independent, I'm very self-confident, socially awkward with people around that I don't know. But for the first time, I did nothing but live day to day. And I just said, I'm going to talk about something that matters to me. I didn't know how to edit videos. I taught myself how to do that rubbish, but you know, it, it, you can still see the videos, which is something. But all these things I did were outside of the confines of HR, outside of the confines of how people had seen me, who'd known me for most of my life. And I'm doing things that nobody could imagine, but I'm doing it is because I just sat with my sovereign power and just said, you know, what is the legacy that I want to leave behind? But also, how do I want to live now? I love that. Do you know what I mean? And I just, and you know, some people go, oh, you have the luxury of that. Yeah, possibly. But I, but I also think somebody once said to me is you have to be very afraid of people who have nothing to lose. At the time that I found my voice, I felt like I had nothing to lose because I just thought everything that I had tried for 20 years to avoid happening happened anyway. So like literally, I, let me just do me. You know, I said to my partner, I'm not going to work for a year because nobody's going to hire me or have anything to do with this black woman that's now going to spend all her time talking about racism. And my partner said, I've got you. Got you. He said, I'll do over time. Love it. And I was like, really? And he was like, yeah, j- just just go do it. Now he's do very it. happy, Erin. When he yeah. sees my book and all the rest of it, he's very happy. Yes, with life. Do you know what I mean? He's, yes. he's very happy. But, you know, and that's the thing. And just I just allowed myself to be. I love that. You just... You gave, I love the words that you chose, sovereign, sovereign power, right? And I love that. So I want to, I want to, I'm taking notes. If you see me here, this is me. I'm always like, oh, I got to give this back to, to I got to give them homework. I got to give our audience things to take away. One thing I heard you say, which I want to just touch on, is something I also believe that you were born into this body, you were given this path, you you chose it. I believe that too. I believe that we were put as souls, as spirits into this physical body to come and we have some sort of assignment. Is that what you believe? Is that what you meant by that? A hundred percent. I mean, to the extent that like when I'm communing with my cosmic guides and, and ancestors. I'm one of these people because I also got told I need to out, ask for help more, right? So I do my best. I, I also say to them, 
I always go, you see this assignment, right? When I come back in my next incarnation, can we just put me in more salubrious surroundings, please? <laughs> so <I'd... laughs> Do you know what I mean, Aaron? I'm like, listen, I'm a council estate kid made good, right? But you know what? For my next assignment, we can start me off in a palace. Like, let's not get it <laughs> twisted. I can still make an impact and do for the people. I just don't need to do it from a council estate. Like, I'd, I've done that this time round. Yeah. But, you know, next yeah. time, let's just upgrade a little bit. Let me just level up. <laughs> can we just... Can we, can we yeah. Just, I don't know yeah. if that makes any difference. But, right, you know, I try. Right. Yeah, while, while we're having this conversation, Spirit Guides, let me just ask this quick question You know what here. I mean? I'm, just like, yeah. Listen, I'm, I'm still going to do my duty. I'm still going to, you yeah. know, all the things that I said, I just, because I do feel like this, this work that I do genuinely will continue in many, many different life forms in many, many different ways. So I'm like, I don't need anybody to question that because there's, and I base that on the ease, for want of a better word, of which I've just, been able to do certain things and not felt that inattention that yeah. I felt in my corporate career when I was trying to climb that that pole of you know ascension to to power and you kind of get there and you think oh this is not <laughs> this is not what I thought it was going to be right so yeah and I just think right I'm meant to be doing this work I'm okay with that and I also know that I you know when it's my time to go um, I did a good job right I was you know I've been told that you know you did good and that's all I need Erin, I don't need details. I don't need anybody to like, you know, that's all I need. And so because you have that innate sense of knowing, it enables me to roll with whatever happens, you know, and not cling so hard to things that I feel like, oh, I really need it. Or this is, you know, oh, if this doesn't happen or this person is like, and just let it go. Yeah. Just just detachment. I think that's like the Buddhist philosophy of detachment, isn't it? And it's that that's where true freedom that's your the best way that you can show somebody you love them is to let them go, which basically means that you don't cling to them for your own. Re- so I kind of apply that in my life as well and just say, well, you know what, if it's meant for me, um, it won't pass me by, you know? That's it. Oh my God, I love it so much. Well, it's also so interesting that you're, the word you chose for this episode was ease. It's come up multiple times. Also, I think when you are in alignment with the assignment that you're given, ease is a natural thing. You don't, like you said, when you're trying to climb that corporate ladder, you're like, this doesn't feel right. This wasn't what I was meant to do. This doesn't feel like where I'm supposed to take my life, this spirit, this soul, this spirit. And then when you are in alignment, it just comes so naturally and you feel passion and you feel what you're giving isn't work. Because I can see from, from, just these few minutes and also just seeing all the work that you do online, it just comes out of everything you do. It's a natural thing you want. That is what you're here to do. And I love that. We call, we say on this show, it's your it, improve it, get it. Um, but I, I will say that that to me is so special and it's very evident in all that I see and, and all that, you know, I'm hearing you say. So, I want to ask you this question because I want to make sure I, our audience gets what they need too, because I love learning about you and I know they are, but I want to give them some practical tips. So if there's a leader listening today and they might have a conversation that makes them uncomfortable. So I read this article, which I love, um, that you wrote about racial equity. And you said, recognize that advancing racial equity requires you to acknowledge that you will make space for when other people call you out. Ask yourself why this fear exists for you. Analyze it. Take it apart. Find your solution, right? Yes. So let me start there. And then I want to go into the practicality. But why is asking yourself that question and analyzing why that fear exists for you, why is that so important? Because I think that discomfort, that tension tells you something. That's a language that your body understands, even though if your mind hasn't connected the dots yet. And the reason why I always hone in on the importance of introspection in doing this work is because you cannot disrupt systems until you first disrupt yourself. And what I mean by that is we cannot always point the finger 
and claim it's somebody else's job to make society fairer, to make workplaces more equitable, to make cultures kinder and genuinely more inclusive, right? Um, Because organisations are not sentient beings. They are made up of people. They are made up of the likes of, you know, of you and I and, and hundreds and thousands of people. So it is naive and it's a fallacy to think that you can just fix an organisation without doing any work with people. But as a leader, you, or as anybody who cares, and when I use the term leadership, just to be clear, I'm not talking about job title. I'm just talking about people who want to demonstrate moral courage and are wanting to put one or two steps forward when everybody else is still huddled in a corner, still deciding or not whether they're going to do anything, right? So we're not talking about those people, talking about you wonderful people who were going like, I I need to do something. So when, and one of the answers that I always give when somebody says to me like, oh my goodness, Shereen, like I love what you're doing. How best can I help you? And I always say to them, you know what, the way that you can help me is to spend some time thinking about what you're afraid of when it comes to this. That's the best way you can help me. You know, yeah, I could tell you to read my book, go read my video, you know, all that good stuff. No, spend some time thinking about what scares you. What are you most afraid of? You know, and I, I, I can honestly share this because like I've shared it about 50 million times, but the crisis point for me that forced me to start speaking my truth and recording the videos wasn't because I woke up and went, oh yeah, I'm going to talk about racism. It was the cognitive dissonance that came from seeing the murder of George Floyd and the video of Amy Cooper in Central Park that just made me think all of this internal narrative that, you know, like you just got to run that little bit quicker. You know, I've just got to mold myself a little bit like this. And, and I just sat there and I thought, where has it gotten me? Right. So all this silence turning the other cheek, where has it got me? But also where has it got us as a people, right? So people who share my heritage, and when I had my little breakdown about sharing my video on LinkedIn, because, you know, like LinkedIn is like the professional eye to the world, right, isn't it? And um, I, I had to confront my biggest fear. And my biggest fear, what I had not realized, I hadn't clocked it, it wasn't anything that I ever thought about was that if I start speaking my truth, I will be rejected by white people. Because I'd spent 20 years trying to assimilate, integrate and mould myself into a vision of acceptability to ensure that white people didn't always keep closing the door to me. So even though um, everyone sees me go, oh my God, Shereen, you're clearly so confident and clearly so this, what I say is that everyone has work to do in regards to addressing racism. It's just very different work. It transcends skin colour and ethnicity and heritage background because we have all been, you can't, we can't all be, you know, drinking the same water and breathing in the same air without thinking that it's affecting ourselves. That's a little bit like racism. So you have to consciously go on a detox program, but know that the detox program that you're going on is lifetimes worth of work. Now, to start that detox, You know, so, you know, when people do like, you know, those little tablets that you put in, the water tastes awful, but it's meant to like detox your liver and all the rest of it. Oh, yeah. The moment of you picking up the bottle of water to drink that is the equivalent of you confronting your fear. So you cannot drink the bottle of detox water until you've confronted what you're most afraid of. That's like a very visual analogy because I'm a very visual person. But that's why this work is so important to do, because if you don't, you will end up perpetuating more harm because you think that there's no work for you to do. And if you think there's no work for you to do, it means you've not acknowledged that you have also been conditioned into a society that values whiteness. Even if you don't see it, that is how society is constructed. And there are lots of very obvious and deliberate tools that we can see every single day that shows that correct. So I don't need to prove that to anybody. So the tension that you get, that you talked about, Erin, which is from a leadership perspective, is like where is that coming from? What am I? Mo- what what could happen to me if I prioritise my black colleagues? What can happen to me if I sign off the budget to do X, Y, and Z? What can happen to me if I say the word racism rather than diversity and inclusion? 
you know, what can happen to me if I believe that colleague who talks about how they've been overtly impacted by racism and discrimination? What am I scared of by believing them? What am I scared of by giving them space to tell their truth? What am I scared of by committing our organisation to be anti-racist? All of these things you have to explore. That is the best way that you can help people like me who are out here singing from the rooftops, you know, um, doing our very best. Um, But that's also the best way that you can help your colleagues, your friends, your peers, you know, people in your network. Um, But it has to start with you first. I love that. That analogy, because I'm a visual person too. I, I, I was like, yes, I see the tablet. But it's what I'm hearing you say is if you don't take the time before you drink the water, before you put the little detox thing in, if you don't take the time and introspectively look at yourself and your own fears and what you want this detox to do for you, it's not going to work. You can drink all of that detox water all you want, but it's not going to do anything that it's supposed to do because you haven't cleared the blocks in your own space. Correct. That's powerful. I'm a, that's going to stick with me a long time. I'm going to, and I will, <laughs> I will copyright it. Shereen D. Daniels. You've Perfect. got it. Okay. It's a yours, but that is, that is, that is powerful, powerful stuff. And I think, you know, I've had, this feels like I've had you here for two minutes. I've talked, I could talk to you forever. And I love, we've talked a lot about what I love that you said too, is the the definition of a leader somebody who has moral courage. It doesn't mean that you have the title, which I think is fantastic because I say we talk a lot about leadership on the show and it is not a title. It's somebody who's listening to this show today and is experiencing an emotion, who wants to help, who wants to be somebody who makes anti-racism a practice in their organization, who shows up authentically, who finds their power, like you said, who stands in their truth and doesn't want to be silenced. And I think this is so amazing. I've I've learned so much for you. And I just want one more little nugget of wisdom from Shireen. So if you could tell, which I now know the definition that we're using of leadership, which I love, what's one thing that you would tell a leader to stop doing? And what's one thing that you would tell them to start doing? I would say stop burying your head in the sand thinking that, you know, this call for socially just workplaces and socially just societies is just a passing fad. It's not going to go away. And I also want people to understand that if you sit in the pocket of discomfort and resistance and don't move past that, then we will forever see the equivalent of Black Lives Matter, the Me Too movement, all of these things that happen because people say enough is enough. And I always want to say how many more people need to be killed, need to be um, ostracized from organizations, need to lose their jobs for speaking out? You know, how many more does it take? And which person do you want to be that enables people to feel psychologically safe for them to not only be themselves, but also to exist in their sovereignty without having to look to you and people like you to validate their existence you know at the mo- at this moment in time that is the responsibility but also that's the power that a lot of leaders have and they don't realize that they have their power their very existence and the way that they operate is about validating and invalidating individuals so is that what you want so that's my first thing and what i would love them to start doing is like start doing the work and, you know, recognize that this is going to be painful and it's going to be uncomfortable. But like, what would you like to tell your children or, you know, your nieces and your nephews, you know, your little niblets? What would you like to tell them in terms of the role that you played as a leader to create cultures that work for everybody, not just the majority because of the way society is constructed? you know and I think honing on those honing on those reasons honing on where that reflection gets you and then practically surround yourself with people who are 
directionally moving the same way that you want to move, not where you are right now. You know, so yeah, that's that's so much more I could say, but I think that's probably it now. Do you know? What yeah, I mean? <laughs> surround yourself. I love that too. It's like it's, if you see people, and I'm. I, I notice that what I love about being a podcast host is I get to surround myself with amazing people who I can learn from and who can bring things to the world that I could not. So I think that right there too is surround yourself with the people who are doing the work that you want to be doing and then do the work, right? So let me ask you one more fun question, which I know this answer, but we say that you're it is that thing that you bring to the world. It's your purpose. It's your, it is your assignment. We touched on this, but tell us what is Shireen's it? My it is speaking in a way that brings people closer to the issues that impact on people like me. So I do it in various different ways. Some of them fun, some of them serious. But yeah, I like to think maybe it's like the vibrational frequency of my voice. Do you know what I mean? Like in my head, I have no idea. (laughs) But in my mind, I would love that. The vibrational frequency. I love that. I'm so into that. The vibrational frequency of your voice, which I, let me just tell you, I mean, I'm looking at you, but if I'm with somebody right now sitting in a car and or I'm like on a walk and I'm listening to this show, I'm like, I and like, it's been a long time talking to you right now. I don't want it to end, but I'm like, I could just listen to you talk forever. Like, I love it. So, and I, I have this really weird nasal twang. I'm like half Southern, half Midwestern in the US here. So I'm like, did you ever see the show, The Nanny? Do you know The Nanny, no, Fran like, Drescher? No. Okay. Well, I'm like her and like on a farm, you know, because she's like a very nasal boy. Anyway, I this is a, what I have to work with. But the vibrational frequency of you is is so high. And I'm so glad we got to experience. And I just tell, tell our audience, if they want to reach out to you, if they want to find you, where they can buy your book, the name of your book, which we didn't even talk about, all the things. All the things. So um, you can find me mostly disturbing the peace on LinkedIn. So I do make people clutch their pearls every so often. Um, I, I, <laughs> I love that. I make people clutch their pearls. Clutch their yes. pearls. Like, oh, Lord. She didn't. She didn't just post that. She didn't say yes. I did. Yes, I did. Yes, you know I me? did. I did. I. God, that is the best thing I've heard. I'm really, I'm, you know, I'm going to write that one down. Clutch. The yeah, pearls. I mean, people keep clutch going, their pearls. Keep yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. When I'm feeling, yeah, I just feel like, you know, like people are getting too complacent. So no, this ain't it. So we we need to step <sighs> yeah. it up again, folks. Um, so you can find me on LinkedIn. I also have um a newsletter, um, which was really random. It's for two years I've avoided doing it. This is a LinkedIn newsletter, um, and I did one edition and had eighteen thousand people sign up. <laughs> amazing i know so i was like maybe i'll just continue doing this so i've got that i've got you can google me on youtube you can google me on youtube you can google me and find me on youtube (laughs) and my book is called the anti-racist organization dismantling systemic racism in the workplace so yeah it does what it says on the tin do you know what i mean so there's there's no pink purples in here there's no soft and fluffy fairy cakes this is um somebody said it's a very easy quick long read because like I'm I'm a woman of few words you know what I mean I like short sentences and a lot of full stops um and I'm sure you've guessed I'm very direct so you know it's uh it packs a punch but it is super practical it's probably the most practical book about dismantling systemic racism you'll ever read I'm not an academic and this is not an academic textbook this is a book that you can have in your office and you can go right what did she say again and then you can flip to the relevant chapter and all the relevant piece and there's lots of questions reflective questions to help you navigate that with your teams and with yourself so I've done my very best to make it as easy as possible without doing the work for you so yeah Oh my God. All right. Well, we're going to link all the things, all the Googles, all the LinkedIn's, all the books in the show notes here. But I just have to tell you, Shereen, first of all, I'm so glad Raj Kumari connected us. And I just want to thank you so much for the work you do again, for making people feel like they have a place where they belong, where they want to belong, where anti-racism is a common word 
And I'm just honored that I had a conversation with the HR conversationalist. And I'm glad you shared your it with our audience. So thank you. Keep spreading it all over, all over the world. I'll keep doing, I'll keep doing my best. And I'm hoping I'll get stateside at some point soon. So yeah, that's, that's like part of the plan, but I don't know when that will be. So for now, we can just create, we can connect over the virtual airwaves. Yes, I love that. Well, I'm here for it. Keep going, keep spreading it all over. Thank you. Thanks, Shireen. Okay, what an episode. What a woman. I'm so grateful to have Shireen on this show. Her it just radiates from every area of her life. So her it, fam, is is so, 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 so important. As she said, anti-racism is not going away. This conversation will continue and continue, and I hope that it does, because we want to make spaces where people feel as if they are seen, heard, valued, and it's equitable. So here's what I want you to do. After every episode, you know I'd like to give you tangible homework to take away, to implement. Here's your only homework for today. Share today's episode with a leader. I also love Shireen's definition of leaders. It doesn't mean that you have the title senior VP or director. It means that you have moral courage to show up and to do what's right. So take today's episode, send the link to somebody in a text message, share it on your Instagram stories, share it on LinkedIn, share this message. This isn't my message. This is Shireen's message. I want you to share this because so many organizations need this work and I want us to continue this conversation. That's all I ask is continue this conversation. Love to hear from you, what you liked, what you want more of from this show, what we could improve upon, pun intended. You can do that by emailing us at info at learn to improve it.com, sending me a DM on Instagram at keep it at real deal or sending me a DM on LinkedIn. And you know what I'm going to say? Keep failing. Keep improving because the world needs that special, special it that only you can bring. So glad you were here. I'll see you next week. Hey friends, thanks for tuning in to Improve It. I am so happy you were along for the ride. If you enjoyed this show, head on over to iTunes to leave us a five-star review and subscribe to the show so you never miss an episode. New episodes drop every Wednesday. Now, if you're really feeling today's show and you've improved it even just a little bit, please take a screenshot and tag me at Keeping It Real Deal on Instagram and share it in your stories. I'll see you next week, but I want to leave you with this thought. What did you improve today and how will that help your future successful self? Think about it. I am rooting for you and the world needs that special it that only you can bring. See you next time. <laughs>